Well, good morning, everyone. Hello, and welcome to First Bank's, well, First Bank's Workplace Banking Webinar Series. I am Amanda Dustman, and I will be your facilitator today. We're gonna to explore the topic of lifetime of retirement planning. Just a quick reminder, the lines are muted, but at any time, please send us your questions through the webinar tool. On to slide two. At this time, I would like to introduce our presenter. David Frederick is the Senior Vice President and Director of Client Success and Advice with First Bank Wealth Management. In his role, David works to communicate complex financial information in a way that is easy to understand and ready to be acted on. In this way, David wants to make sure his clients can sleep better so they can dream bigger. In addition to his role with First Bank, David is also an adjunct professor of economics at Washington University in St. Louis. On to slide three. Our disclaimer for today, the opinions expressed in the presentations are statements of the speaker's opinions and are intended only for informational purposes and are not necessarily the opinions of First Bank. Thank you, David, take it away. Thank you very much, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. It is tremendous to be able to join you this morning for this webinar. Today's topic is a lifetime of retirement planning. And let me tell you, today's topic is a big one. Retirement planning is perhaps the one financial goal that is shared by just about all of my clients and everyone I've ever met. Uh, the idea of saving for retirement, saving as you work so that one day you may not be, uh, you may not have to work or you may not be able to work, saving for that, that day to come. Now it is a big topic, but today we're gonna to talk about the basics of it. There are many other relevant topics that go along with, uh, with retirement planning, lifestyle spending, major purchases, how to plan for your kid's education if you're retired, how to plan for buying that lake house, things like that. Uh, we're not going to reach that far out. We just want to make sure we have a good core understanding of what retirement is and how it is that uh, retirement can be effectively planned for. One of the things that I will tell you is that in retirement planning, you are not alone. Um, First Bank has personal bankers and financial advisors who are tremendous resources to help with budgeting, investments, and all aspects of retirement planning. If you have questions, and we'll have a chance for questions at the end, uh, if you have questions that go beyond today's webinar or need some help, I would strongly encourage you to reach out to personal bankers and financial advisors that are present in First Bank. So let us lay out the course for our conversation. It's a big topic, but I hope that it will be guided by three very simple questions. What is retirement? We're going to look at what it is that retirement really is and have a conceptualization of the challenge that it presents so we may know how best to focus our efforts on this goal. Number two, how to plan for retirement. What are the tools and mechanisms at our disposal that will allow for effective savings and retirement planning? And number three, when? One of the interesting questions about retirement in the 21st century is, when should I actually retire? And the spread of ages is getting uh, broader and broader as my practice continues. So where, it, once upon a time, there was a set retirement age. Nowadays, it's a matter of when should you retire and, and considerations to, to take into account for that. Um, there will be time for your questions at the end. I encourage you to please type your questions into the chat and Amanda will present them to me and I will, I will answer them at the end. So for right now, let's dive right in with a core question. What is retirement? Everyone seems to think they have a sense of this um, and, and on a certain level they are correct, but let's dig into some of the intricacies of retirement. First of all, retirement is an end of employment. You are no longer getting up every day, working a nine to five job. You are no longer working for an employer. You are no longer earning an earned income. That paycheck that you've earned throughout your life uh, will no longer be coming in. Moreover, um, while the paycheck stops, so do re uh, employment benefits. For instance, employer provided health insurance, employer-provided life insurance um, and other fringe benefit and, uh, provisions by your employer are likely to stop with retirement. So we see retirement as, a, as an end to your earned income and your, and your usual inflows. 
But retirement is also a time then that you have to switch from earned income to relying on what you've saved. Uh, there will be a reliance on savings and fixed incomes for your spending needs. As we think about retirement, we think that life expectancies are increasing. Now, there's been a little stall in the actual increase of life expectancies in the United States for the past couple of years, but as a general matter for the course of the past several decades, life expectancies in the United States have been increasing. I would encourage you to say, to be able to plan for 20 to 35 years of retirement. So 20 to 35 years of living off of savings and fixed income for your spending needs. What's interesting about retirement is that even though your income has stopped, your expenses will continue. So there are the lifestyle expenses, uh, food, clothing, entertainment, transportation, those expenses will continue. Taxes will absolutely continue. They may drop off a bit as your earned income might go down, uh, income taxes may drop, but retirees are not exempt from taxation. It is important to budget around these uh, continuing expenses. Moreover, there are likely to be new expenses on the horizon. Healthcare uh, costs tend to increase the older that we get. And while there is Medicare available uh, to help with that as a government program, there are also costs associated with Medicare, uh, particularly providing Medi Medicare supplement insurance or providing for things that Medicare will not provide for. Also, as we get older and older, we tend to need assistance in our living, in our lifestyle, uh, long-term care, ne long care needs, either by way of an assisted living facility or in-home long-term care assistance uh, and assisted living. So our existing expenses are likely to continue and new expenses are likely to come. Moreover, inflation will tend to continue to increase. Now, what you see in front of you is uh, a history of inflation from 1980 to 2020, uh, 50 years worth of inflation. And you can see how everything with one really interesting exception, everything has tended to increase decade upon decade in its total cost. This is the inevitable march of inflation. The one side note uh, is the 2020 gasoline price actually dropped, but that is, has to do with the peculiarities of travel in the uh, world of the COVID pandemic uh, and the drop of, of energy prices that went along with a lack of demand for oil. Uh, but other than that one really rather odd exception, prices continue to increase year upon year. So I want you to view retirement as this intersection of earned income stopping, a reliance now on savings and fixed incomes from what you have saved, but also a time for spending and potentially even increased spending. It is a time where we have to plan very carefully to make sure that our savings and our fixed incomes can meet the needs of our spending, uh, whereas right now we're meeting those with earned income that's going to stop. All right, so that is what retirement is, and that's how I'd like you to conceptualize it. So it's a major change. How do we plan for this major change in life? Well, to tell you this, I'm gonna use a little bit of clip art and I'm gonna give you a bit of a history lesson. Historically, in my line of work in, in, in wealth planning and client advice, uh, retirement planning in the 20th century was known as the three-legged stool. Uh, for all of you listening on the line, you may have heard this expression before, the three-legged stool. The three-legged stool was the idea that your retirement was supported by three separate, equally contributing financial provisions uh, that you've been developing throughout your life. The first one is social security, second one is your employer pensions, and the third one is your personal savings. And if you had those three stools, you had a stable and reliable retirement. Let's take a look at each of those. Social security uh, is a program, uh, government sponsored by the federal government, and it's a simple, public pension program. That's what it really is at its core, is a public pension program. While you're employed, you spend your lifetime paying in to Social Security, where you establish for yourself an account value. 
that account value is not actually like a bank account or, a, or an investment account. It doesn't have an actual numeric value to it that you can you know, tap into when you want to buy a house. It is instead a set aside that says how much you'll receive as a monthly basis when you retire. And the more you pay into it, the more you'll receive in retirement, although there are some very substantial caps. So you can't expect to pay $10 million into it and get a million dollars a month when you retire. It's a, it is meant as a, as a baseline uh, income. So you pay into it during your employment. And when you retire and claim your social security benefits, the government will actually pay out on a month by month basis to help support your retirement based on the amount of accumulated credits that you've uh, accumulated from your lifetime of paying in. The second form of uh, support for the 20th century retirement model was pensions, employer-sponsored employer retirement plans, employer-sponsored pensions. These were known as defined benefit plans because with a pension system, when you declare retirement under the 20th century model, the employer would have an ongoing obligation to pay you a portion of your earned income month upon month, year upon year for the rest of your life. Say your earned income was $5,000 a month with your employer, uh, a typical pension might pay you $2,500 a month. Depending on how long you worked and what your actual earnings and contributions were, a defined benefit was this ongoing um, amount of money that would be paid monthly by the employer. And this was interesting because it put a lot of risk on the employer. The employer had to maintain the funds sufficient to pay ongoing pensions for retirees that were no longer providing valuable services to them. It was an ongoing liability uh, where it was, had, to, had to provide savings and cash flow for it on its own. So it was all putting the, the risk on employers, but if the employer defaults, then all of a sudden the, the employee's retirement collapses as that leg of the stool goes away. So there was a great, there was a, a great deal of benefit to this from the employee's perspective, but also some amount of risk. Finally, the third leg of the 20th century retirement stool was personal savings, bank accounts, investment accounts, home equity, what you had under the mattress or in your piggy banks, that kind of personal savings that would be, as I describe it, ad hoc, maybe kind of improvised, uh, would be whatever you happen to have around. Uh, and that provides for a third leg. Some people are better saved than others. And in the 20th century, some people would rely more heavily on Social Security and pensions and were not particularly well saved. Uh, hopefully, if you didn't have a, a good pension in your future, you were extra diligent in your savings. But that is what retirement used to look like. I want you to have that as a frame of reference, but let's focus on what retirement looks like now. In the 21st century, especially this, this all started in about 1973, and it came into fruition really in the 1990s. Uh, but now in the 21st century, retirement looks different. It is no longer a three-legged stool. It is now a two-legged stool with one leg and then one great big fat leg um, that holds up our retirements or is expected to hold up retirements now. Now, some of it has not changed. The social security leg stays in place largely as it was before. But now, instead of having personal savings and employer-sponsored pensions, we see this new leg that's much bigger and broader and supposed to encapsulate more of employer-sponsored savings plans. All right, so what's going on with this? First of all, let's, let's say it, social security is, it takes the same place it does before. You pay into it, your value accumulates, you take a benefit when you retire. Uh, and it will provide some of your cash flow needs in retirement. But employer-sponsored savings plans are the replacement for the two legs that we saw in the 20th century of personal savings and employer-sponsored pensions. As pension liabilities grew and grew, it got to the point where pension liabilities were becoming unsustainable. And employers started to look around for alternatives. And those alternatives cropped up in the 1970s especially. By allowing employers to sponsor what are called defined contribution savings plans. And this is meant to be a joint effort between the employer and the employee to save for and provide for the employee's retirement. I'm gonna tell you nothing new when these plans are, what you've heard of before, 401k is by far the most popular, 403b, 457, all these number four plans, um, there's uh, references to specific uh, sections in the tax code. 
But these are the plans that's meant to be as a joint effort between the employee and the employer in creating a savings for that employee's retirement, rather than having a defined benefit. Now it's a defined contribution. The employer will pay into the system and the employee will pay into the system, uh, but it's not gonna be an ongoing defined benefit that the employer must pay a paycheck to the retirees for the rest of their lives. Uh, the payment into the system should be well diversified into investments, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a few moments. And in order to encourage both employees and employers to engage in the system, there's a heavy tax preference in the system. The tax preferences are arranged a little bit differently uh, among different systems, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But there's a way to encourage employees and employers to pay into the system that the government has by mitigating and reducing your taxes when you pay in. Uh, we'll investigate that a little bit in a moment. There are generally two types of retirement uh, systems that are government sanctioned. Uh, and this should be uh, familiar to people on the line as well. Traditional plans um, have a very specific tax structure to them and a payment structure. Uh, that's anytime you see 401k, IRA, 403B, 457, anything that doesn't have the word Roth in front of it, you can pretty well understand to be a traditional plan. It doesn't have to say traditional, although sometimes for clarity's sake, your, your statement might say traditional at the top. But anytime you see, uh, anytime you don't see the word Roth, assume traditional. On the other hand, there are also Roth plans. Roth plans are a different structure and they're kind of the flip side of the coin of the traditional plans. You can have a Roth 401k and you can have a Roth IRA. I think there's still some needling about Roth 403Bs and those are not widely available. And I think 457s, I don't know if they can be Roth. But Roths are available for the majority of people who are providing for the retirement under a 401k system. Uh, you can likewise usually have access to a Roth 401k. Now, the operations of both are very important to understand and we're gonna walk through them do understand they operate differently. All right, let's start with a 401k plan. This is going to become a, a slide that is filled with information, and I'm going to walk us through it step by step. So, so don't worry, um, I'm going to hold your hand as we walk through this, uh, and it's going to have a lot of information by the end, but we're going to see how it all builds on itself. So let's say you're an employee with a company that has created an employer-sponsored 401k plan. What does that mean for you? Well, first, let's start while you're employed. While you're employed, you as the employee can make contributions to the plan throughout your employment and receive a tax deduction for your contributions. If you make a certain amount of money per year, let's say you make $50,000 per year, uh, which would be your taxable base, but you put $10,000 into your 401k plan, for your tax purposes, it's as though your income is now $40,000. You actually get to deduct right off the top the amount that you put into your 401k plan. So there's a tax benefit to the employee to put in, and that's the incentive to try to get us to save into the 401k plan for our retirement. Likewise, while you're employed, the employer may, and I'm going to underline that word may, match contributions to a certain level. Employers are not required to make contributions to your 401k plan, and they're not required to match to any specific level. There are certain requirements for employers that if they don't match, they have to make sure that their 401ks are operating in a very egalitarian way, and they have to go through certain specific testing that's kind of beyond the scope of today's conversation. But while you're contributing, your employer may also be contributing to this plan. Okay, so the money goes in, you get a tax deduction as it goes in, what happens when the money's inside? First, your contributions are invested in appreciating assets, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, et cetera, which can grow tax-free. Uh, it is possible for you to put your money into a 401k and have it sit there as cash. That, that idea is not terribly well recommended by wealth advisors like myself. Uh, the idea of a 401k is you put money in and it has a chance to grow. And if you have a long-term employment, say 20 or 30 years uh, with a given company or amongst companies, you wanna give it a chance to grow even as the market goes up and down a little bit, the market tends to go up. So leaving it in cash is, is not typically uh, what we tend to do. 
But what happens as it grows, even though it's accumulating dividends and interest and appreciation and capital gains as it grows, there is no tax as the assets inside of a 401k plan grows. It grows tax-free or really, and we'll talk about this in a moment, tax deferred, but still a good deal. Moreover, that money is yours. Now there is certain, uh, there are often cliffs for employee ma employer matches to 401ks. Uh, you can't necessarily be with an employer for two weeks, have them put a big 401k match in and walk away. Sometimes there are clawbacks for what is the employer match. But after a certain period of time, the employer matches all vest to you, which means it's your own money. And certainly everything the employee puts in themselves is fully vested, it's your own money. This 401k belongs to you. Though it's administered by your employer, it is your money. It has special rules, but it is your money. And when you leave your employer, you are allowed to leave your money with them in the plan if you want, but you're also allowed to take your money with you without disrupting the tax benefits that go on it. And the best way to do that is typically to roll over the 401k into what is called an individual retirement account or an IRA. Those IRAs can be uh, managed by your wealth managers. For instance, First Bank Wealth Management does a lot of management of IRAs. Roll over your 401k to an IRA and we can manage those assets for you. Make sure it's all well invested but you can take that money with you when you leave. And as you move to a new employee, uh, excuse me, a new employer, you might have a new 401k and still have an IRA that's a rollover from your last one. But with this process of accumulating a 401k and rolling over into an IRA, you have, you're building your retirement nest egg. All right, so what happens now? While you, while you are under the age of 59 and a half, you can, can, take early distributions of your money from the 401k or from the IRA if you rolled it over. Now, the idea behind this and the idea that the federal government has come up with for these qualified retirement systems is to create something like a piggy bank. We want you to put money in, but we don't want you to take money out until you actually retire. So if you take money out uh, before attaining the age of 59 and a half, uh, you will pay the taxes on all the money that is in there that you take out. So you'll take it as ordinary taxable income. But you'll also pay a penalty, a 10% penalty for trying to take money out early. The idea, again, being that you set this money aside and you don't take it out until retirement. So you've built up that retirement foundation. There are a couple of exceptions for medical expenses or first-time home buyers where they can take money out without, the, without tripping much of the penalty. But as a general matter, the idea is to leave it in there as long as you possibly can uh, until you reach retirement. Now, when you in fact reach retirement, you'll have access to retirement distributions. At this point, uh, upon reaching age 59 and a half, the employee is capable of, they can, they, they don't have to at this point, but they can take taxable distributions starting at age 59 and a half with no penalty. The distributions will be taxable to make up for the tax deduction that you got up front and for all the tax-free gain that occurred inside the 401k plan. When money comes out of the 401k, it is taxable. When money comes out of your traditional IRA, it is taxable. And there's very little getting around that. Uh, you can get around that potentially with what's called a qualified charitable contribution or excuse me, qualified charitable distribution where instead of taking the money out of the IRA, you, you give it to a charity directly from the IRA instead. But if you're taking it for your retirement, which is what we're talking about today, you will be paying tax on it. So starting at age 59 and a half, you can take out money without a penalty, but it will be, it'll still be taxable. Now here comes the, the final point. When you reach the age of 72, you must start taking taxable distributions uh, what, are required, what are called required minimum distributions starting at age 72 and going for the rest of your life. Um, I don't mind telling you that the 401k uh, is sort of like a little bit of a deal with the tax devil, but it's a good deal. Don't let me dissuade you by saying that. The deal with the devil is that you will get a tax deduction up front, tax-free growth over time. That is a very, very good deal to have. 
But it is also true that at the back end, the devil gets his due starting at age 72. Uh, the Congress and the IRS want this money to not be tax-free forever. They want it to come out. They want it to start being taxable. And the way that they do that is they start requiring you to take minimum distributions from your 401k according to a set economic schedule starting at age 72. At that point, the, the cash, the, the flow from the 401k will provide for a lot of your retirement, but it will also be taxable as it comes out. This is the traditional structure. Tax deduction up front, taxable distributions on the back end. All right. Let's put that as against a Roth structure and see what the differences are and hopefully make this kind of clear. So a Roth 401k is going to look a little bit like a, a 401k, a traditional 401k with a couple of big differences. First, the employee can make contributions to the plan throughout employment, but, but there is no tax deduction up front, no tax deduction for what goes in. This is the primary difference between the Roth and the 401k. Likewise, the employer may make uh, may match contributions to a certain level, uh, and they may contribute as well. Contributions are once again invested: uh, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate investment trusts, uh, gold, silver, whatever it is that you want to invest in. Uh, depending on what the platform is that the 401k offers, there's usually a broad array of investments available. The assets will once again grow tax-free. There's no distinction about that. The assets in the Roth will grow tax-free. The employee can also, upon leaving employment, uh, roll their Roth 401k into a Roth IRA. You can take the money, it's your money. You can take it with you when you leave employment just as surely as you could before. And you can put your Roth IRA with your own wealth manager. Again, First Bank Wealth Management manages a lot of Roth IRAs the same way we manage a lot of 401, uh, a lot of traditional IRAs. Early distributions. Early distributions are a little bit different on this. The employee can take distributions before age 59 and a half. It will generally pay full tax and 10% penalty on all of the growth. Now remember that the money that you put in, the principal amount that you put in is your own after tax money. The idea is that you should be able to take that out without incurring the income tax but there's still a penalty and a tax on the growth if you take it out before age 59 and a half. There's still an incentive to try to leave it there to provide for your retirement. Retirement distributions. The employee can take tax-free distributions starting at age 59 and a half with no penalty. Notice how it says tax-free distributions. This is the other big difference between the Roth and the, the traditional 401k, Roth and traditional IRAs. That with the traditional, you got a tax deduction up front, but then taxable income on the back end. It's exactly reversed with the Roth. You have to pay taxes up front. You have to pay taxes on the money and only put in after-tax money with no deduction at the start of a Roth 401k. But when you're all done and ready to start taking out, you can take the money out with no further tax consequences. And moreover, you are not required to take the money out at all. Uh, there is no required minimum distributions. Remember, the, the point of the required minimum distributions is Congress and the IRS want to tax that money sooner or later in your traditional plan. In your Roth plan, you can let the money roll. You can let it roll and grow tax-free as long as you want up until your death. Um, but that money is not foisted upon you the same way it was with a Roth or with a traditional plan. So Roth money is kind of magic money, but you pay a price for it up front in paying without a tax deduction. All right, that was as simple as I can make it, the distinction between a traditional 401k and a Roth. So you may be asking yourself, as a lot of clients ask me, which one is better? Should I be using a traditional 401k? Should I be using a Roth 401k? Which one is the better option? And I'll tell you, there's a really easy answer to this. The, and the answer is this. It's a question. Will you have higher income now while you're working? Or will you have higher income in the future after age 59 and a half when you're retired? 
For most of us, the answer is easy. My income is going to be higher while I'm working because I have all this earned income. And my income is going to be lower in retirement because I'm going to be living off of my savings. If your income is higher in employment while you're currently working, the traditional IRA is preferred. The value of the tax deduction is higher when your income is higher and thus your tax liability is higher. The value of that deduction is higher. If for some reason you say, I'm going to be a multimillionaire when I retire because my small business is going to take off or, or I'm going to have some other form of income in my 60s and 70s. If you foresee your income being higher in retirement, the Roth is better. The Roth is better because the value of the income tax deduction is relatively low now, considering that your taxes will be high in the future and having access to tax-free money in the future, <clears throat> excuse me, will be a benefit. Again, like I said, most people have higher income when they are working and thus most prefer the traditional 401k to the Roth. I will say as a side note, it is also possible to convert from a traditional plan to a Roth plan. And some retirees, uh, as they approach retirement or in retirement, will start to investigate the conversion from a traditional to a Roth. That comes with a tax liability all its own, but it's something that my colleagues in wealth management and I often talk our, our clients through. All right, so we've seen the Roth, the traditional, this makes up the employer-sponsored plans by and large. What else is there? There is still the ability to save for retirement on your own. There's an incentive to save for it with your employer-sponsored plan. There's still the ability to save on your own. Bank accounts, always an excellent way to save. There's usually very little risk to the principal in a bank account, although in the current interest rate environment, there's also rather little to gain through market growth. You can have outside investment accounts. Investment accounts have risk and return. They can grow, they can also lose value, uh, but their, uh, their gains are usually taxable as they accrue. One interesting aspect of retirement is the use of life insurance for retirement. Uh, this is something I would encourage everyone here to investigate, how life insurance might be used as a retirement fund. Let me tell you a little side story very quickly. Um, I'm in my early 40s, and I have four children under the age of eight. Um, I don't know how that happened, but here I am. So I'm the primary breadwinner of my family. And if something were to happen to me, uh, my family would be very hard put. So I have a substantial life insurance on the value of my life to help my wife pay for the mortgage and my kids' education if, if I were to die. However, once my youngest child is out of the house, and once my wife goes back to work full-time, she's a physician, and when she goes back to a, a full-time medical practice when the kids are done, uh, I don't know if I need to have that kind of death benefit for my family. They're now on their own two feet, more, more or less, at which point my uh, life insurance can convert into a retirement plan, uh, one that also has its own special tax preferences in it. I would encourage you, if you're looking for a supplement for your retirement, contact a First Bank Wealth Advisor, uh, financial advisor, and ask them about how uh, life insurance might be used both to provide for a death benefit, but also to potentially provide for retirement. Uh, one more on the list, health savings accounts. We all know those can help pay for uh, health expenses for people that have a high deductible insurance plan, but they also can be used for retirement structures uh, if you, in fact, allow them to grow. They grow tax-free, uh, and they have a huge tax benefit for them as well. Some people will overlook the health savings accounts retirement benefit. So let's, let's review. Make use of your employer-sponsored plans. Budget consistent contributions to your retirement savings. One of the nice things about 401ks are that they usually allow you to set aside a percentage or an exact dollar amount to be put in every paycheck or every month. Uh, I would encourage you to do that automatically so you don't have to stop and say, will I save this month or do I want to spend a little bit more? Let the savings come first. Pay yourself first. Monitor your investments and adjust according to uh, changes uh, in changing circumstances. Investing can be a, a difficult function and, and, and it may require professional help. I'd encourage you to reach out to a first bank financial advisor to talk about your investments and how they may all be brought in the line for your retirement goal. Do not touch the savings until you're actually retired. 
That is an excellent way to maintain a continuous growth or retirement savings. And then reach out to financial professionals, like I said, a financial advisor or a personal banker here at First Bank for help with your budgeting, to help review your investments. Uh, for financial advisors can make retirement projections. They can also talk to you about life insurance and how it may fit in. So do reach out. You're not alone in this process. There is help available. Let's very quickly talk about the last question, which is when. So I talked about what it is, talked about how to do it through these uh, savings mechanisms. Let's talk about when to retire. It used to be that the answer was, when do I retire? 65. Easy. No, no, no question. That's the answer. But it's now different for everyone in the 21st century. And there's a range of ages to consider. Here are some suggestions for ages to consider in retirement. First. We've already seen 59 and a half is when you can start taking penalty-free distributions from your IRA and your Roth IRA, your 401k, your Roth 401k. And that's when you really start to have access to your retirement savings. It's 59 and a half without a penalty. At age 62 is the earliest time you can claim Social Security benefits. Uh, Social Security benefits will have a discount based on your total value if you claim them early but you do have access to that monthly lifetime guaranteed income early. 65, uh, still a very common age. It's when people can start taking Medicare and you can start shifting that major health expense from employer health insurance to uh, Medicare. 66 to 67, depending on your uh, exact birth date, by now it's mostly 67, is when you can take full retirement benefits, full retirement age benefits from Social Security. 70 is the last uh, point that the uh, Social Security benefits can grow to. Uh, so if you're waiting for Social Security benefits to grow, uh, they don't grow anymore beyond age 70, and there's no reason to take them later than age 70. And 72 is when you start taking required minimum distributions for your retirement from your 401k or your traditional IRA. So look at this, whereas it was 165, now we see a, a plausible range of about 12 and a half years where retirement can occur. This does require some guidance, and I would encourage you again to reach out to a financial advisor with First Bank Wealth Management who may be able to help you walk through this, know what your options are, and know how to follow through. All right, I'm gonna conclude quickly before I start taking questions. What is retirement? Retirement is that important intersection between no more earned income and yet growing expenses. It is something that requires budgeting. It, re it requires careful saving. It requires discipline. In the 21st century, uh, people have to save for themselves, often with their employer's help, but they typically do not have a defined benefit pension they can rely on. And and God bless you if you do, those are just not around very much anymore. Follow through on your retirement goals and make consistent automatic contributions to your retirement and then retire when the time is right. That's the best way to say it, retire when the time is right. It was once 65, now it's any time between 59 and a half and 72. It could even be earlier than 59 and a half if you have other savings. In order to help determine if that time is right, if you have a good budget, if you have good savings, I'd encourage you to reach out for help. First Bank Personal Bankers can help you with a lot of this, budgeting, regular savings, uh, potentially introduction to a financial advisor for investment help. First Bank Financial Advisors are excellent, uh, very intelligent professionals who can help you look at your retirement options, make sure you're well invested, potentially investigate life insurance. And I'd encourage you that if you don't know who your personal banker is or your financial advisor who's available to you, uh, reach out to my friend Steve Willick, who is the director of Workplace Banking. He will be able to guide you to the right person. You see his email address at the bottom, steve.willick at fbol.com. Reach out to him and he will be able to point you in the direction you need to go. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, I went about three minutes longer than I was expecting to, but I'm happy to take any questions you might have at this point. Thank you very much. Amanda, are there any questions? Thank you so much, David. Uh, yeah, we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is, why would I wait to take my social security benefit? 
So Social Security has a designated full retirement age. Uh, it is either between, it's between 66 and 67, depending on your date of birth. Uh, for most people born after uh, 1965, I think it was, it is 70, 67 years old. If you take it early in, in, at age 62 or any time before 67, you'll be taking a discounted benefit. The benefit will actually be smaller, but it will last longer. So you'll, you'll have it early, you'll have it for a longer period, but it'll be substantially discounted. If you wait till your full retirement age, call it 67, you will not have to take a discount on your Social Security. And you can defer Social Security uh, into uh, up till age 70. And as you defer it, every year that you defer it, it grows. The value of the benefit actually grows, and it grows by 8% per year, which is a pretty substantial growth. You'll have it for a less period of time, but you'll have it uh, at a higher rate. Um, and, and there are some calculations that we can do to help you figure out if we know, frankly, if we know what day you're going to die, we can help you figure out exactly when to take it. But the answer is you discount it early, you get some extra growth if you wait for uh, a long period. Based on actuarial tables and most people's life expectancies, full retirement age is usually the right answer. Wonderful. A couple more questions. I know there are particular contribution limits and eligibility requirements for Roth 401ks and Roth IRAs. What happens when you find out you have contributed too much or are no longer eligible for a Roth plan? So, yes, Roths are very well guarded and IRAs are kind of guarded in particular uh, because Roth money is magic money. Roth money grows tax-free, it comes out tax-free. Um, and what will happen is if you put too much in and you discover that mistake, you'll have, it, you'll have to back it out, which means that you'll actually have to take the money back out and put it back into your checking account and figure out something else to do with it. And a good wealth advisor, um, wealth management advisor should be able to help figure out if you've contributed too much into a Roth and we'll be able to back it out for you. Um, if you if you put too much in and it stays in and the IRS discovers it, it's gonna be taxed, it's gonna have a tax penalty applied to it, and then it's gonna be backed out, it's gonna be backed out anyway. You're gonna to be told to take it out. Uh, it cannot be allowed to stay in there and grow tax-free if you're over the uh, maximum income, over the maximum contribution, or you're otherwise not eligible for it. Um, so if you're, especially if you're operating off of an IRA, make sure that you talk with your wealth management advisors about how to put into a, a, an IRA, a Roth IRA. If you have a Roth 401k, your employer sponsored system should be able to help you figure out if you can and how much you can put into that Roth 401k. Wonderful, thank you, David. Couple more questions. Uh, realistically, is Social Security going to be available in 10 years or even ah. 20? I've heard my entire life not to plan on it. Yes, it's that's a that's an interesting question. So I'm going to try to answer this question without making a political statement, um, and, and I'm going to try very hard. Social Security by now has a very special place in the hearts and minds of not only the American people but also the American budget the American federal government budget. It is what's known as the third rail, uh, the idea of the, the rail that's on the subway line that if you touch it, you get electrocuted. Uh, no one wants to touch Social Security for fear of it getting electrocuted. There was proposals back in 2010 and 11, I think, where Paul Ryan, who was, um, I think it was then Speaker of the House, having taken over for John Boehner, and he was going to run as um, vice president for, Mitt Romney in the 2012 election, Paul Ryan was investigating options for uh, limiting uh, entitlements, including Social Security, and making it more from you know a defined benefit to a defined contribution plan. Think of the pensions that that employees or employers have largely left behind in the 20th century because the the cost of pensions got too high. When it comes down to it, Social Security is a defined benefit pension maintained by the federal government. Um, and, and Paul Ryan's investigation was to try to see if it could switch to a defined contribution, a lot like employers have switched. And the answer was no. The answer was there was no political will to make that change. And what has happened instead is every, I'm gonna say about every decade, I can't tell you specific years, but about every decade, Congress allocates certain amount of extra budget to shore up Social Security. 
Social Security is uh, sponsored primarily by our own contributions to it uh, through a Social Security tax. Uh, but there are usually one once a decade, once every several years contributions by the federal budget to shore it up if there appears to be a shortfall uh, and put it into a lockbox uh, that will help maintain it. Uh, finally, um, Social Security tax increases are one of the things that is on the radar for the Biden administration and the new Congress, that with the Biden proposed tax increases, there are several provisions to increase Social Security taxes, especially for people making over $400,000 a year. Um, this is a, a, apparently a dedication that Social Security is likely to continue to be funded uh, through taxes, through tax increase increases, and through one-time allocations, rather than to be eliminated or reformed. Uh, I've had this conversation with clients I will show them projections of a $0 Social Security payment, but for all of my information, I say that it is still a reliable aspect of, social, of uh, retirement planning. Well, thank you, David. Okay, the questions are rolling in. Okay. I, thought, I thought there was a minimum amount required to leave your old 401k with an employer. There could be. Um, what's interesting is employers have a fair amount of um, empl <laughs> employers have a fair amount of uh, flexibility in the type of plans that they offer as long as they meet basic requirements that are put in there by the federal government. Um, I don't know if there is a specific uh, dollar amount that's required. I will say this, I, much to my, my shame, but I'll, I'll share it with you. I have an old uh, retirement plan back at a former employer that, I, that has only a few hundred dollars in it. And I always think that I need to roll it over. And I always forget about it the next day. And then I get a statement you know, uh, a quarter later and I know I need to roll it over there. So that one only has a few hundred dollars in it. And I know that it's still being maintained. Um, I, I don't, there is not a universal answer to minimum dollar amount to maintain a 401k after you leave an employer that I'm aware of. Although check the plan details and ask your plan administrator if your specific plan has one of those requirements. Great. Now, this question is about an HSA. If this is used to fund retirement, doesn't it have to be used up each year or forfeited? Or am I confusing that with something else? You are confusing that with an FSA. So there are two different types of employer-sponsored health plans or health savings accounts. The first one is the HSA, the health savings account, which is, a, um, is only available if you have a high deductible health insurance plan. And the idea is that you can save money and take a tax deduction, save money into that savings account uh, to provide the funds necessary to meet your high deductible. Uh, money goes in with a tax deduction, money can be invested and grows tax free. And if you spend the money on healthcare when it comes out, uh, it can be uh, tax free when it comes out as well. It's what's called a triple tax benefit. Uh, moreover, money can stay in the HSA. It is your money, it can stay there. Uh, until you reach retirement. And once you hit age 65 uh, and you're on Medicare, you can take the money out for whatever purpose you want. And yes, you'll pay taxes on it like it's an IRA, but there is no, um, there is no penalty on it. The thing that the, the person asking the question is thinking of is what's called a flexible spending account, a flex spend. Flex spends are usually available. I think they're available even if you don't have a high deductible plan. They're available more broadly, and they're a little bit more funded by the, um, the employers than HSAs are. HSAs have optional contributions by employers. FSA, FSAs, I think, have rules that require a little bit more employer contribution. But those are a uh, spend it or lose it by the end of the, end of the year uh, aspect to them. So FSAs are not retirement plans, uh, sort of built into them. HSAs are. And HSA is triple tax benefit can be an excellent option for retirement plans. Great. Next question. When you mentioned being 59 and a half being the minimum age to withdraw penalty-free distributions, does that apply also to the money you put in or just the interest over time that it grew from? For a traditional account, that, re that means the money that you put in as well. Remember, with a traditional account, you put in money and you get a tax deduction for what you put in up front. So you put in 
say $15,000 in a year, you get a $15,000 tax deduction. And the money then enters this special, it's called a qualified, a special realm where it grows tax-free and tax-deferred. But it, And while it is still your money in your account, your access to it is very specifically guarded. So it's not just the growth that comes out uh, taxable, it's all of it that comes out taxable to make up for the tax deduction you got up front. Like I said, it's kind of a deal with the tax devil. With a Roth, it will be the growth that comes out. With a traditional, anything that goes out, or anything that goes in, will never come out without paying a tax on it unless you have a very specific exception like giving it to charity instead of giving it to yourself. There will always be a tax on the, on the traditional 401k and the traditional IRA upon the money exiting and being distributed. Wonderful. Next question. Would taking retirement funds out from a Roth plan and a traditional plan lower the marginal tax rate that the traditional retirement plan is taxed at? Yes. Well, this is, the, yes, an excellent question. And whoever asks this has a tax mind uh, uh, of my own heart. And that is that if you're talking about distributions to provide for uh, retirement after age 59 and a half, you can get access to the money penalty free. But before age 72, where you have these requirement distributions, if you retire in that range and you're going to start taking money out, uh, to have a tax, there's a tax efficient way of doing it, of liquidating your IRA, your Roth IRA, and any sort of separate investments that you just have in a separate taxable account. There is a, there's a sort of a magic mix of those that we at First Bank Wealth Management can help you find if you're interested in discussing that. Um, but it is a, a, a way of lowering your total tax by not taking it all out of your IRA, uh, taking some of it out of your Roth IRA, but also not taking it all out of your Roth IRA so it's not there for future years. There is, a, there is an equilibrium level that we can help you find, uh, at least within a given range. It may not be a specific dollar amount. It depends on your, on your tax, uh, appetite, how much tax are you willing to spend? But yes, there is a very good way of doing that efficiently, and that is an excellent question. Yes. All right, next question. How do you see the potential or proposed tax credit versus tax break impacting 401ks if that should become law? So there is this distinction. All right. The, the goal of the 401k is to try to encourage um, non-millionaires to save for retirement, to try and encourage what are called the rank and file uh, to save for retirement. And the idea is that the savings can come in and have a tax deduction applied to it. There is also evidence in the federal government that tax deductions are more valuable to millionaires and tax credits are more valuable to the rank and file. So the difference between the two is a tax deduction means that your taxable base is reduced. So if you have $100,000 of income and you get a $10,000 tax deduction, now your taxable income is 90 and you apply the tax rate against that. A tax credit is a credit against the taxes that you owe. So if you have $100,000 worth of income and a $10,000 tax credit, your full $100,000 is taxable. And let's say the tax is owned on that is $25,000 in taxes. But a $10,000 tax credit will eliminate $10,000 of the tax liability. Now you only owe $15,000 in taxes, which actually means that you'll lower your total tax burden. There is a lot of investigation into the idea that the rank and file might save for retirement more efficiently if they had a better tax incentive, which is the credit rather than the deduction. Now, that is a couple of things. One, that is probably true. It is probably true that if I were to offer you a tax deduction that is worth, I don't know, three or $4,000 in real terms to you, or if I offer you a tax credit that is worth $10,000 in real terms to you, you'd probably take it. You'd do what it takes to take the, the tax credit. That's called economic rationality. You, you'd pursue it. That's number one. Number two, it seems like that's a complex idea to pursue that the deduction is very clear cut. You put money in, you get a dollar deduction. There would not be able to sustain a system where you put a money, a dollar in, you get a dollar credit. Credit would be a lot harder to calculate 
based on the amount of money that goes in, the amount of earned income, employer match potentially. It's just a harder number to 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 figure out, and it might frankly make your you know your April fifteenth deadline a lot more headache inducing to try to figure out what exactly your credit is. But it is more complex. And number three, one of the things that Congress really has to watch out for is Congress uses the tax code to incentivize us to do certain things like buy a home with a mortgage interest deduction or um, pay our medical bills with a medical deduction. Uh, it also incentivizes us to save for retirement with the 401k structure and the Roth 401k structure and the tax forgiveness that offers. But Congress still has to fund the operations of a multi-trillion dollar federal government. And it cannot lose out on too much, too much tax revenue. And one of the criticisms I've seen is that if you put in place this credit system, unless the credit system is going to match pretty close to the deduction system, it might actually end up starving the federal government of funds in an, un, in an unforeseeable way and, and put a, a new fiscal crisis on the government. So it is, it is something that I've heard kicked around before, and it's something that I've never seen get very far in the implementation idea because of its um, complexity and potential risk to federal revenue, although it does match the goal of, in, of further encouraging um, retirement savings, uh, specifically if it's done right. It has to be done right for that to happen, but it, it really could do that, yes. Wow, that was very interesting. Okay, we're going to squeeze in two more questions. Okay. Even if you expect your income during retirement to be less than during your working years, does the risk of higher tax rates in the future warrant using a Roth 401k rather than the traditional 401k? Yes, another excellent tax question off, up to my own heart and one that is going to sort of tiptoe along a political question and political answer. So I don't typically forecast in tax increases into the wealth plans that I help draft for my clients, in part because it depends heavily on the political makeup of Congress and the political makeup of the White House as to whether there will be a tax increase or a tax decrease. In 2017, with a Republican Congress and Republican White House, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act substantially reduced taxes. Now, with a Democratic Congress and a Democrat in the White House, it looks like there's a tax increase on the horizon. Uh, they go up and they go down. So I don't try to read those tea leaves as to whether they'll go up or down at any specific point, especially with an individual's retirement. Having said that, if the client is very cautious of tax increases and they come back to me and they're, they're emphatic in saying that taxes are going to go up in their lifetime, they just know it, then yes, a Roth can be an excellent way to mitigate against that in part. I would still push back very heavily if my client said, I want to put it all into a Roth because I think that taxes are going to go up even though I'll have no in earned income. The Roth as a percentage or as a portion can offset that risk, but I would not put all of my eggs into that specific Roth basket, especially if taxes go down or if taxes stay the same and you're just not working, uh, that will have been economic loss. So I will allow for some amount of hedging, especially if my clients are very um, politically emphatic on expected increases in taxes. But I, I push back on putting the whole thing into a Roth because of expected tax increases based on changing political winds. Great answer. Okay, last question. My investment elections have generally performed well, so I've not rebalanced. Is that a really bad idea? Well, rebalancing is a rebalancing is a good idea as a general matter. Uh, the the to, to give a little background on this, when you invest in assets in your 401k or your or your IRA, Roth or traditional either way, uh, those assets will grow and they'll probably grow at different rates. Stocks tend to grow faster than bonds. Bonds tend to grow more reliably than stocks. Um, gold tends to grow in value when stocks and bonds are going down. Um, and a well-diversified portfolio is important to capture the growth and the, uh, to mitigate the risk of downside. Now, as time goes by, you'll see that the things that grow faster start to take more and more and more of a percentage of your account, which means that you're, you're interested, inter entering what we call a, uh, a, uh, a risk of um, 
Oh, shoot, the word just lost me. Um, you're entering a risk of putting too many eggs in one basket. Um, and so it is often a good idea to spread out again. So if you find yourself moving well beyond uh, the percentages that you've allocated, uh, clicking that rebalance button is probably a, a reasonably good idea. And if your assets are managed by uh, managers like at First Bank Wealth Management, uh, rebalancing is one of the things that they do as a service for you. Now, the other answer to that question is, as time goes by, your risk tolerance changes. When you're young and you have 30 years until you're gonna retire, you can take on a lot of risk in your portfolio because you have a lot of time for any losses to be recouped and gains to come back. Uh, when you're older, uh, you have less time and thus you can tolerate less risk. So in that case, there's also a rebalancing of switching from high risk assets when you're young to lower risk assets when you're older, which typically means that you move from stocks to bonds. And, and often, you know, a very common portfolio we'll see for a young person is 60% stocks, 40% bonds. But as you get older, those percentages shift such that by the time you're usually ready to retire, uh, you may be finding yourself in a portfolio that should be about 40% stocks and 60% bonds. Uh, and again, those kind of rebalances are important to, to go along with your risk. And one more time, just to say it, um, the, the wealth advisors can help you figure out what the right risk is, what the right asset allocation is to meet your risk, and help you shift that over time. By the way, the word I was trying to think of earlier is, is concentration. If you, put, if you allow your um, assets to grow without being rebalanced, you'll soon find yourself in a concentrated position in the assets that have grown too high. And I'm not going to say what goes up must come down but you want to mitigate the risk of it, in fact, coming down. Wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. Well, thank you, David. And I'd like to thank, thank all of you for joining us today. And a very special thank you to David Frederick for their time and expertise. Please do take a few moments to complete a brief survey to help us improve our service. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day and we'll catch you next time.